Hi, this is Carl Lochnan, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Just to start, music was a big part of your family, I believe, growing up. Oh, yeah. Uh, my parents absolutely loved music, so, you know, there was just music playing in the house as long as I can remember. I can't remember one day where records weren't being played. In those days, that was before pre-TV, so, uh, you know, that makes me about... Um, I was born in 1942, so it makes me about uh, 97 in the shade or something. But... Um, uh, you know, everyone, there was no television, so it was just radio and recording. So I think everyone listened to music back then. And, um, you know, they were no exception. They they loved music. They had a lot of parties and stuff. So they had a lot of great music, too. They listened to all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, a lot of vocal recordings, but um, things from shows and um, and some of the swing period, too, as well. They liked all the, you know, Glenn Miller and... Artie Shaw recordings and all that sort of stuff. So I grew up with a lot of that. So what was it initially that uh, drew you to the saxophone as an instrument of choice? Well, um, when I was a kid, I I wanted to... My next-door neighbour was actually band leader from Sydney who used to run the Trocadero Band. He's a famous uh, trombonist, Frank Coughlin, and he... I used to, he was an ex door neighbor, so naturally I used to hear him practicing. Um, and he used to practice the trumpet a bit. He was a trombonist, but he played trumpet as well, a little one. So it was, being a harder instrument, that was the one he put the time into on his uh, days off um, from working, because I used to work there pretty much every night, I guess, uh, at the Trocadero. He was there for years with the big band. And so, you know, I'd, I'd hear that, and so that attracted me to it, and I wanted, to, I wanted to play the trumpet. As a matter of fact, he gave me a trumpet mouthpiece. It was funny. And, you know, when I was very young, I used to sit out in the backyard trying to buzz the mouthpiece, but I wasn't very good at it. And also my parents, because, you know, the trumpet's quite a loud instrument, so when they found out I wanted to play the trumpet, they put the lid on that. So that went from there. So I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't get started till much, till quite much later um but my father used to like all the old freddie gardner recordings i don't know if you've ever heard of him but uh he was a a popular uh saxophone player an english guy of the time a great player but he used to play a lot of the old tunes like smoke gets in your eyes and all that sort of thing i'm in the mood for love and so I heard that when I was young. I don't know if that led me to the saxophone, but uh, eventually I got there. But uh, it was much later when I started up. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I didn't get started until later on. But I always loved music, you know. Yeah. Yeah, before your saxophone work, you were working uh, as a vocalist and a ranger. Yeah, I, I started off, that's what um, I was just going to get to. When I was, um, when I was quite young, I found out I could sing, and it would seem to be a natural thing um, that I could do and I so I was singing in school choirs and of course after being um, you know after being told I couldn't get a trumpet that was it I didn't want to do anything else so I decided yeah look I, I can sing so I'll do that so that's what happened I started to get um, into that and then I was in two groups I started off the first group I was ever in was a group called the Crescents uh, that were a trio and um we just got together. One of the guys knew Johnny O'Keefe, and he encouraged us. He heard us, and you know, encouraged us, and it went on from there. So that group was around for uh, a few years, and we did a few recordings, uh, quite a lot of recordings for a festival. And uh, uh, Lee Gordon's label, a label which was uh, Lead On label, and we did the Johnny Ray show and um, a couple of other things uh, at the Sydney Stadium, and then. Um, I was still singing then. I was getting interested in, I was always interested in instrumental music and I sort of started fiddling around with the piano, um, you know, when I was probably 12 or 13 or something. Um, but I was pretty much self-taught. I used to just, we had an old piano, I used to just fiddle around, but I could do it all by ear. And then I started arranging the, uh, the uh, vocal arrangements for the group. I used to work out the harmonies and that and then later on I started to get into writing uh, instrumental arrangements 
uh, for the bands and stuff that we used to work with. You know, it was pretty basic stuff to begin with, but I um, got better as I got went along. And then um, the Crescent sort of disbanded, and I had an opportunity to join the Deltones. Their lead uh, singer, uh, Noel Weidberg, was was killed in about I think it was 1961 or something somewhere around then. Uh, he was tragically killed in a. He was only about 21, I think, at the time. And I think I wouldn't have. I would have been a little younger. But um, he was. He was killed. So they. They asked me to join. So the Crescents were sort of finished, and I thought, yeah, well, this is a good opportunity to join a, an established group, and they were very established at that stage. So I was with them till 1967. We toured overseas and we went to um, Asia and various places. And um, I, I became more interested with the instrumental side of thing and, and was doing a lot of uh, arranging then. I was sort of studying, self-studying um, books and things. And so I got really into that. I used to write there whole arrangements for their big band. We used to work with big bands in the Philippines and um, Hong Kong and stuff when we went overseas. And when I got back, uh, around about 1967, I started to get itchy feet to um, get it, you know, to do something different. And I was also um, starting to get a lot of work um, as an arranger in town. And I, I'd also taken up the saxophone a couple of years before, about 1965, I started taking some lessons in Sydney and then I was, you know, not doing it as a living, so it was a bit of a hobby at that stage, but I was really serious about it. And so in 1967, I decided to leave the Deltones and then that's when I started the saxophone career. Um, so that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and you spent some time studying in the United States in the early 70s. How important do you rate that period of time now? Oh, uh, very important. Um, that was, yeah, that was the first time I ever went to the States, I think, was, I went over there, um, with Sandy Scott, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, he's a cabaret yeah. artist. Yeah. And, yeah, well, Sandy got a tour to go to Canada and took a five-piece band, trumpet and, and saxophone and, um, a rhythm section, three-piece rhythm section, piano, bass and drums. And we went over to back him, and uh, it was a fabulous trip. We went right across Canada, um, and the trumpet player and myself went to New York. Uh, we went we went from uh, Vancouver right across to Toronto and Montreal, and then from there the tour finished, and the other people went back home to Australia. But um, the trumpet player Alan Nash, his name was was um, he was the president of our uh, musicians union here for years. Uh, we decided to go to New York and hang out and have a look at jazz clubs and everything. So I went there, and then from there on, he went home, and I stayed on and uh, went to L.A., and I ran into a fellow called Victor Morosco, who was an um, outstanding woodwind virtuoso saxophone, but he played flute and clarinet as well. And you know, I just happened to run into him in a rehearsal band one time, and I heard him, and he was phenomenal. And I thought, oh, gee... I think I'll try and take some lessons with this guy. So he really uh, did a lot for my playing. Um, so that was a yeah, that was a a very uh, good you know point for me because before that I'd had some tuition in Australia, but um, uh, it went to another level with this fellow, and that really helped me. So I got more serious about it. Not that I ever wasn't. I was always pretty keen and practiced, and uh, but it just gave me new things to work on. Um, then I come back to Australia again, of course. Um, I was only away for a couple of months at that period. And reading through some of the work you did after that point, when you did return back home, the the uh, the list of people you work with is uh, pretty diverse. People from ranging from Freddie Hubbard to Slim Dusty. <laughs> is, is that something? <laughs> yeah, you... that was over the years. I worked with Freddie Hubbard much later on, um, and uh, that was in a that was with a big band um, that that was here in Australia and um, we wished to back a few people that come and Freddie Hubbard happened to turn up so that was that was great, that was fabulous. But before that I did a lot of commercial work, studio work um, and um, arranging and you know doing playing on 
uh, commercials and people's records and all that sort of stuff. But um, I suppose the next important um, thing after Sandy Scott, I joined the Daily Wilson Big Band mm -hmm. um, for a period. And then, um, of course, after after that, I joined the Airs Rock Band, um, who you're very familiar with their music. Um, and that was a very creative period for me. I got to uh, write a lot of my own music. Um, and, you know, we did two tours uh, to the United States. You probably know about it, a bit more about this band than any of the other things I've been in, I guess. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. Um, it's a great band, and uh, we've lost two of the members in the group. Um, Duncan McGuire was the bass player in the band, and he died oh, many years back now. I just don't know how long it is. It's got to be close to... I don't know, 20, be about 20 years, years. Yeah. it would be at least that long. And um, four years ago, I lost uh, one of my best friends, Jimmy Doyle, who was a guitarist in, one of the guitarists in Airs Rock. Um, that was a pretty sad time for me. We remained close um, pretty much, you know, right up until the time he passed away. We we worked together. We, we, uh, we after Airs Rock, we worked together with did a lot of work with George's fame when he came out here and did tours of Australia. So uh, we were pretty close mates. He used to, um, he was on, um, uh, I think it's 99.3, is it, FM here over at uh, Chatswood oh, yeah. in, uh, in Sydney. And, and he, he was he had a musical program and there and playing jazz and, and other stuff. And I used to go on as a guest and uh, we used to have so much fun on that show. You know, we used to... Uh, do all our uh, routines that we used to do on stage uh, with the Airs Rock Band. We had a couple of uh, funny routines we used to do, um, their dialogues and stuff. And we, we had a ball, and uh, then he come down with liver cancer, and um, he unfortunately uh, passed away pretty quickly. And so that's a, that's a real loss uh, for the uh, guitar player world. He was a very, very good guitar player, yeah. very natural guitar player. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, excellent blues player. As a matter of fact, some of the reviews he used to get was uh, they, especially in America, they used to say that he was, uh, you know, one of the best blues players they'd ever heard, you know, and this was from Rolling Stone and different magazines, so he was highly rated uh, as a as a bluesy type guitar player, fabulous player. So when you joined Airs Rock, was that something you were specifically looking to do, to get into a band-type situation like that? No, look, Jimmy and myself were mates. Jimmy Doyle and myself were mates before that, and we'd worked together in a couple of hotel bands and different bands, and, um, you know, we enjoyed each other's playing, and when we played together, we, you know, something happened. We sort of had a good communication together. So I was in London at the time, um, living over there with my family, um, in I think in 1972 or three, um, and I was working over there and living there, and um, my kids were going to school there and everything. And uh, we just decided we got itchy feet, my wife and myself, and decided to um, go and you know go through Europe in a combi van and do all that sort of thing. Um, just drop out for a while, and then I got into the music you know scene over there, and I was working and everything. And anyway, I got a call one day, and it was Jimmy and. Jimmy said, look, I've got this terrific band and it's got Duncan McGuire in it, it's got so and so and so and so and And at that stage, we were getting a bit disillusioned with the weather in London and, uh, and um, you know, just the general living style. Unless you've got a lot of money over there, it's uh, not a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were anxious to return home to our families as well. We'd been there for nearly a year. So it was about time to come back. So uh, that's when we made the trip back and we moved down to Melbourne and we lived in Melbourne for three years, and I was with the band for, well, I think, from 70, gee, I can three till about 77 or something, 77, 78. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did a couple of tours um, over in the States, and we, you know, got our, we did our first album um, at the Armstrong's uh, recording studio in Melbourne, and um, on the strength of that, we were offered a contract um, by A&M Records in America, and uh, we went over there and did a tour and then come back and work in Australia, and then we went back again and um, did another 
you know, did another tour. Uh, that was a fabulous time. It was great. That uh, first album, as you mentioned, was recorded at Armstrong's. It was recorded live with a, a studio audience, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a it was a live album uh, studio audience, um, and uh, you know, on a small shoestring budget. And there's a funny story behind that album because we we did it and. You know, hardly put any in money. It was live and everything. We just mixed it off, you know, the next couple of days, and that was the end of it. And um, anyway, Michael Gadinsky was the um, head of Mushroom Record Label, and uh, at the time, and he had a lot of other acts, uh, Skyhooks, and a lot of other people that he had on, uh, you know, in his camp. And anyway, he he took our record over and. Um, I mean, he liked the band, but he, I think he thought we were a little progressive and a little uncommercial, if you want. And I guess mm. we were because we we were sort of a bit jazzy, rocky, or um, fusionist, and um, we were considered an underground band or a band that appealed to, you know, a select audience, but not a not a huge uh, following. Uh, Actually, we were not considered to be that commercial. So anyway, he took the he took a whole stack of uh, his his artists' recordings over to A and M and um, went over there. And anyway, so I think he was pretty surprised when he when they said they'd like to sign us, and they didn't sign the others uh, for a long time. I think we were the first ones in, and then they, uh, you know, the rest of history. He's had some tremendous, um, you know, Kylie Minogue, and before that, all sorts of people. Mm. And so, but I think he was a little surprised because he rang us from Los Angeles, and he rang Jimmy, and Jimmy rang me. You know, it was about three o'clock in the morning. And Jimmy rang me and said, "Guess what? And you know, um, we've got a contract with A and M. They want to take us over." And uh, I said, oh, what happened? He said, oh, Michael Gunitsky rang me and said, you're never going to believe this. They liked your album. <laughs> and Jimmy said, well, I, we hope they would. That was quite funny because I think Michael was, was shocked. Um, but he was also happy, of course, because it opened some doors for him. And, you know, he did like the band. He used to follow us around. But I don't think he really understood what we were doing um, that much. But he knew the people seemed to like it. So I guess he... Uh, thought it must be okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the same, though, I always felt with Ayers Rock, there was enough evidence there of a, of a commercial sound, you know, a few songs here and there to to attract a mainstream audience, but there was also a lot there for the more serious musical lover. Did, did Was that an intentional uh, thing for the band to, to try and cross over two fields there? No, I think how that come about, it wasn't. It wasn't intentional. I think because the guys come from different backgrounds, I'd come from more or less you know, come from a jazz, jazzy sort of background. The other guys had come more through the rock scene. Um, I'd come through the rock scene, started in that, and of uh, course, of vocalist and everything, and then went through that, and then I started to get interested more in the jazz um, thing when I took up saxophone. So uh, my writing or the sort of tunes that I wrote was, were a little more in that vein, and the stuff that they contributed to had come from what they'd been listening to. So I think that was it. It wasn't intentional. Uh, and, and in some ways, it probably made it hard to market in some ways because it was a bit of this and a bit of that. Yeah. But the thing is, A&M um, was, at the time, it was Herb Alpert, who was the um, uh, trumpet player and, and, and co-owner of, um, of A&M Records with him and um, Bob Garcia, they, they, they were the people who, who um, signed us up. They liked this. It was something a little different, you know, and, and it was something that was commercial, as you say, but was also interesting enough to, um, to appeal to people that were, you know, more into, you know, creative type music. Yeah. So they liked it, and um, the first two went really well, and um, then they asked us to come back again, and when we come back, we did the second album there. There's some terrific footage on your website of the band playing at uh, the Sunbury Festival. Do you have any standout memories of that? <clears throat> no, no. It was um, those times were great. I mean, it's um, it was a very exciting time. We were all young, and and uh, and uh, music was all all happening then. And uh, yeah, it was just I don't know. We we. 
you don't think about those things as much, I guess, at the time because we were very, very busy in those days, you know, running from here and we were working almost every night in Melbourne and we'd do tours and then we'd go overseas and we'd come back and, you know, we'd do something and it was, you just took, I don't know, you just, I mean, even when Freddie Hubbard came out, it was funny, nobody thought to record it. And, you know, these days, you you know, it's you, you just couldn't imagine why somebody didn't, but we were just busy and, you know, the band never thought to tell anyone to record <laughs> it. So, you know, we did these gigs at the basement and everything and uh, with this jazz legend, uh, trumpet player, and, and nobody even recorded it. I've been trying to find out if somebody did, but nobody did. So uh, we were all very pretty busy in those days. I mean, the work scene was uh, absolutely tremendous and very different to how it is today. Now, the second album, Beyond, had quite a, a budget behind it. When you listen back to it now, can you see where the, where the money went? Were you as more satisfied with that album than the first one? Yeah, well, I was. I sort of liked both of the albums, but um, I liked that one because I had an opportunity to really stretch myself and write some arrangements for you know a very big string section um, from Hollywood, which is about the best you could get. Um, so they were fabulous players, and uh, I couldn't. It was hard to um, to believe that my arrangements would sound so good in the hands of people like that. But they just made the you know. It's funny how you can write something um, that's very that you think's okay, and if you get it played by an average band, it'll sound average. If you get it played by the top uh, people, it sound you know it sounds quite different, you know. And so that was a, a, a great thing for me. I mean, I'd written for orchestras here in string sections, but I, I think Hollywood at that time anyway was the mecca of recording all the film. The great films were being done there. They had been done in the past, things like Gone with the Wind and, you know, all the rest of the stuff that had come later, like E.T. and Superman. It's, it's still recorded there. Everything's recorded there, so it, it's uh, that was a great experience. Um, the budget, yeah, was sixty thousand dollars, which was a lot of money back then. Um, it wouldn't be now; it'd be practically nothing. But back then, it was an awful lot of money. Um, we spent a lot of time in the studio. The producer we had, uh, a guy called John. Oh, I'm trying to think of his name now. Stronach, I think. Stronach, yeah. <coughs> and so he was very particular about what he wanted in terms of, you know, he'd go through 10 snare drums and, you know, um, 18 electric pianos. <laughs> you know, he'd keep getting them. They hired them there. and You know, they hire big hire companies. And they'd bring in things. He'd say, no, that one doesn't sound right. And, you know, send it away. And so you'd spend a day fiddling around so we spent quite a lot of time in the studio so it was a big production and from the sound point of view it's much superior to the first one um, I think anyway I think it's a you know much classier sound but I wouldn't say it's you know a better album because most people seem to like the first one better than the second one you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the second one did sell pretty well it sold um quite well in the States it was recorded it was um, released rather on two separate labels it was released here on Mushroom and then it was released in the United States on um, A&M recordings so, so uh, same with the first one so between the two countries it sold you know pretty well yeah now you weren't part of the band when it got back together for a third album were you, were you approached to... no I'd, I'd left by then um, the band's sort of, you know, more or less went our separate ways there, um, I think in about 1977, 78 or something. And also I was, you know, I've been on the road a lot throughout my life and it was time to, you know, settle down and, and um, be with the family more because when you're moving around all the time, you can't take your family, you know, everywhere you go. So you're, you're away for months and I've been doing that for a long time, so it was time to... To uh, settle back down and um, and have a bit more stable sort of life, and also I was getting a lot of offers, different offers here, um, especially for writing arrangements and and doing work, different various work. So I thought, oh well, if that period's over, I'm going to move into something else. So I think it was a 
a conscious thing for all of us. Um, and then the band went on. I don't know if they went immediately back to it. I think there was a bit of a break, and then uh, then they they put out the Hot Spell album. I'm not sure when that was released. Do you have any? Yeah, I think it was early 80s, about 81, I think it was. 81, yeah. yeah. Well, we finished in about 77 or so. I think Beyond was recorded in 76 or... I can't remember now. Yeah. Do you have that one handy there? Or? Uh, not in front of me. Yeah, Beyond 76 sounds about right. Yeah. 76. Yeah. So it took till 1981 uh, for Ayers Rock to do a third album. So there, there was a bit of space... In between, I'm not sure. We just all went our separate ways and did our separate things, you know. Yeah. And every you've worked extensively in through the years as teaching. Uh, do you find yourselves at time when you are teaching, sometimes you end up teaching yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Yeah. I, I think that, that you do discover a lot from your students. And, you know, not that you want to think of using them as guinea pigs, but I think when you are honing your craft as a teacher you do need to try various concepts to see if they're going to work and how this will work with this person, uh, you know, dealing with different personalities that you're teaching. So I've done a lot of teaching over the years, a hell of a lot. Um, I started at the Sydney Conservatorium in 1979 and I'm still there um, as a saxophone teacher, you know, 31 years later. So um, I think you do, you, you do teach yourself as well. So you learn a lot about teaching um, about how to teach, and I think it takes a long time to be a good teacher. I'm still trying to be a better one, um, and uh, I think that's just one of the things that happens with anything you do. You 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 seem to get more experience as you go along, hopefully. Talking about your your last CD, Allen Street, I believe it was named after the street you grew up in. Yeah, that's right. I, I was born in uh, Randwick, uh, in Sydney, which is uh, over near Bondi and Coogee, in that way. And, um, yeah, so the, the, the inspiration for it come from that and, um, uh, you know, just, I thought, use the, use the old house. So we went down and, uh, sort of tried to photograph the old house, but it wasn't, it would look different now. So we, I ended up finding an old photo that we used on the cover. And, uh, on the cover, if you look closely, it's got a little, got a photo of me when I was about with hair I had hair back then <laughs> when I was about 15 and I'm holding my cat and dog uh, out the front of the house so we found that and the a graphic artist who lives in Melbourne who's very very good uh, a guy called uh, Giorgio Elzin, um he runs an, uh, a, a graphic business called 2 to you give him a plug um, he's a terrific designer and he designed the website and he also designed the album so he put that on the cover and then he put a photo of me looking so that it looks like I'm looking at myself the young 15 year old and the old guy now um, uh, with the saxophone there and so yeah so that was it and so there's a lot of old family shots and um, things in there I mean I, you know I wouldn't be in music other I don't think except that I think my parents were just, you know, they, their passion for music was so great. They just loved dancing. My mother was a dancing teacher. My father just loved music. And always, I just can't remember, there was never a day when it wasn't wasn't on. It was on night and day. <laughs> all they used to love records and play them all the time. And they used to have a lot of parties. And everyone danced in those days, you know, sort mm. of the old-fashioned type of dancing. And so, there was, you know, I... I think that made me, you know, catch the music bug. Um, I think you you get attracted to music in some ways. I don't think you make yourself a musician if if it's if you know if you if you don't love it. I think anyone that becomes a musician does it because they're attracted to whatever it is That's right. that they hear in music. You know, um, I think everyone basically in the world pretty much like music <laughs> it just depends on which type but you, you do get attracted to it and I think if it's around your house well then there's more of a chance that you you that's what you've grown up and that's what you think you you know that's what you think is there to do well the tradition continues in your family because your son is on the album with you as well that must have been a wonderful feeling to have him on record with you yeah it was yeah it, it's a real joy doing anything with your kids um, you know, like that sort of thing, and um, 
it was great. He was he did like music pretty early too, you know, because he would have to come to the gigs and the kids, you know, were in at Sundry, <laughs> um, very young, and uh, they, you know, they get used to the music too, so they they sort of grow up liking it. And but you don't try and push them. I mean, I think you can you can come from a music. You know, you can be in a musical family and not have musical children. Uh, you know, and on the other hand, you can come from a non-musical family and they come out of the woodwork. You just don't know where they've come from. So that that can happen. Uh, but um, with my son, uh, my eldest son, he um, he, you know, just got attracted to it not too early. We had him taught piano. And then he wasn't really interested in the saxophone or anything else. He just played piano for a long time and uh, did a bit of acting and did a bit of this and this. And then one day he, he said, when he was about 12, he said, I want to get a bass. And I said, what do you, what do you want a bass for? <laughs> yeah. And he said, oh, I like an electric bass. He'd been listening to the Beatles. He'd discovered the Beatles. Um, and so he started on the electric bass and then he went to the uh, acoustic bass, which he played on, on the Alice Street album. And he's still working around as a musician, uh, doing different things, and we do a few little projects together, but that's the only album we've done together. We hope we'll do something again in the future. And the duo album you recorded back in the early 80s with Steve Murphy's also found re-release on CD. Tell us about the sessions that that album represents. Um, well, that goes back a long way. That uh, goes back to 1979 when we first started. Um, that was a bit after Red's Rock, and... Um, I'd always liked playing with guitar players somehow. I think it's it's a good tenor saxophone and guitar seems to be a really good sort of blend together. It makes a, a sound anyway. So I've been playing with Steve a bit. He lives in Melbourne actually. Um, Steve Murphy is still down there, and um, but he doesn't play guitar anymore. Um, he had sort of problems with his hand, and you know he was unable to play. Unfortunately, he had to give it away years ago. But um, we we were started to you know play a bit together in different bands and then we we went into the recording studio at the ABC where they gave us a bit of time and they said you know why don't you guys put down a couple of tracks so we went in and just played a couple of things together and we we liked what what we'd done and so that went on and then we had a bit of a break and then eventually we finished the thing in 1981 uh, and they released it on vinyl. Um, then and then later on uh i rang steve up and said to him listen mate i think we'd better put this try and put this stuff onto cd now yeah you're interested and he said yeah that'd be great so um i i did this one myself um through uh la brava um which is a label up here jazz label and um that was released in 2004 i think yeah so mm. it was long time right after the 1981 but um yeah it's done pretty well it's sold a few i mean it's hard it's uh, it's always difficult selling jazz albums it's it's something that you can't make a lot of money out of and if you recover your cost you're probably doing pretty well but it's nice to have the music out there, out there so yeah. people can get it again and also you know cd is the medium now and so you know people aren't playing vinyls anymore so <laughs> that's it yeah. But, uh, yeah, but uh, it came out quite well. We didn't do anything really much with it. It had been mastered before, so we more or less just transferred um, the old tapes, which I still had. I had the masters, so we just had them um, transferred to digital, and that was it. Did a bit of artwork, and um, uh, some fellow did the artwork on that that did Ellen Street. Oh, okay. Georgia. Yeah, he said he's very good. If anyone's looking for. Somebody to do it too as his T U. If you type that in on Google, you'll get him. He's very good. He's very creative. He's done lots of um, albums for people like Steve Hunter and various people and, and um, all sorts of um, designs. He's very good coming up with um, unusual looking sort of covers and things. Concepts. Wow. All right, Cole, before I let you go, uh, any upcoming plans you could uh, tell us about that in terms of live work or, or recording? Well, Recording nothing uh, specific at the moment. Um, I do, you know, from time to time I do jazz festivals. I'm doing something at a Manly Jazz Festival and 
that's not till October, and I'm doing some things in Belgium and Port Macquarie um, up there for the Jazz Society up there in September, and you know, just do a splattering of gigs here and there. I mean, I'm mostly teaching these days um, and trying to do as much playing as, as I can, but um, the work is not as uh, fluid as it was in the back of the air rock days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I'm still at it, and I still enjoy it. I think I'd do it anyway, whether I was getting money for it or not. I think, you know, music's a joy, and it's something that uh, if you can make money out of it, it's a a plus. But you do it anyway. That's that's correct. Great to catch up with you, Carl. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, well, thanks very much. You know, it's really nice to have somebody uh, interested in what you're doing, and uh, it's been great. Thanks, John. No worries. All the best. And uh, I'll let you know when this is going to air and I'll, I'll give you an air date and all the details. Terrific. Good on you. All right, mate. Thanks again. I'll see you later. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.